Billy Shears, famous for his spectacular music-making skills for the Beatles, Wings, and his own solo career, is more commonly referred to as Sir Paul McCartney. On November 9, 1966, the original Paul McCartney, after an argument with his fellow bandmates, fled from the recording session angrily. While driving down the M1 motorway, he was decapitated in a fatal car crash and was quickly replaced by a look-alike, William Shears. Or at least, that's what some believe. In early 1967, rumors began to spread that Paul McCartney had indeed been killed in a car accident in late 1966. A popular fan-made magazine known as The Beatles Book published an article in February of 1967 addressing the rumors, but did not go into vast detail about the accident or McCartney's potential replacements which was rumored to have been the choice of the th other three Beatles, John Lennon, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr. The Beatles quickly caught on to the rumors and began to introduce backmasking into their tracks, but we'll touch on that later. During the fall of 1969, rumors of McCartney's death had began to take its place into popular culture, especially in the Detroit, Michigan area, where the earliest mention of it occurred on radio. On October 12th of 1969, on the radio station WKNR-FM, a caller spoke with Russ Gibb about the rumor and possible clues to the rockers' potential cover-up. The caller was most likely a Detroit college student who had heard of the rumor from a September issue of the local school's magazine, Drake Times Delphic. The magazine issue in question included an article with the title, Is Beatles Paul McCartney Dead? By this point, the rumors had spread like wildfire and everyone wanted to know if the man they had heard on the radio and saw on television was an imposter. In October of 1969, McCartney received more press in a personal interview with the BBC. In it, he deemed the rumor a load of old rubbish, and hoped that if people were to hear his voice, then quote, they would see the light, end quote. This, however, failed. Fortunately for McCartney, the rumor seemed to be on the decline. On November 30th, 1969, a televised event known as Paul McCartney, The Complete Story Told for the First and Last Time, premiered on WOR in New York. It was hosted by celebrity lawyer F. Lee Bailey, who questioned and interviewed Russ Gibb, Fred Labor, and other prominents in the theory. He also interviewed some close friends of McCartney, who opposed the theory. Bailey left it to the reviewer to decide for themselves what the truth was. Before the shooting of the television special, Fred Labore told Bailey that his article was actually intended to be taken as a joke, to which Bailey replied, We have an hour of television to do. You're going to have to go along with this. Shortly after this TV special, the rumors fizzled out. Temporarily. In 1975, the rumors were once again picked up with the release of Klaatu's debut album, 347 Eastern Standard Time. Klaatu was a Canadian rock group that was rumored to be the Beatles themselves under a different name, but we won't go into detail about that topic. The album was said to have been recorded in 1966, but was mislaid until the 70s, when the three remaining Beatles decided to release the album in Paul McCartney's remembrance. Once again, these rumors fizzled out when Klaatu was confirmed to not be the Beatles. The 1980s didn't see much activity in terms of the rumors. However, in 1993, McCartney released a live album alongside his studio album, Off the Ground, called Paul is Live, which featured a cover similar in style to that of Abbey Road. Paul is seen chasing his dog down the crosswalk at Abbey Road as a way that both spoofs and hints to the rumors. But what exactly are the rumors? What evidence did people have back in the 60s that made them so sure that the bass guitar player from the Beatles had died in a horrendous car accident in 1966? 
let's begin by taking a look at the first album Billy Shears supposedly appeared on, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which released in May of 1967, just six months after the horrific car accident that killed Paul McCartney. While the tracks contained on the album hold their own evidence, the front and back covers of the record arguably hold more. The Beatles stand in front of a large audience of celebrities and important figures from the time and behind a brass drum with the band's name on the front head. The bass drum is very important because if one were to hold a mirror up to the center of the words Lonely Hearts horizontally, it reads 1, 1, Roman numeral 9, he die, signifying that the real Paul McCartney died on November, the 11th month, on the 9th day. Take a look at the yellow guitar arranged from flowers towards the Beatles' feet. It appears to be a left-handed guitar, and it makes the shape of McCartney's Hofner violin bass guitar, which he used during live performances and occasionally in the studio. Flowers are often laid at the gravesite of a person who has passed away. The guitar only has three strings, meaning that McCartney is the missing string in the group of four people. All four Beatles are holding instruments. John, George, and Ringo are all holding brass instruments. However, Paul is seen holding a corangelis which is a black woodwind instrument that is half the size of an oboe. Black is often referred to as the color of death, and the fact that McCartney holds the only black instrument in the group must have something to do with this death. Located above Paul's head is the open palm of comedian Isley Bond. The image of an open palm above someone's head is said to signify death in Eastern mysticism. Let's take a look at the doll of Shirley Temple, wearing the Welcome the Rolling Stones sweater. Underneath her appears to be a glove, similar in style to what race car drivers wear. A closer look reveals that the glove is covered in a red substance, which can be clearly analyzed as blood, once again alluding to the fatal car crash. All in all, this whole scene depicts McCartney's burial. The words the Beatles spelled out in flowers can be depicted as a grave, hence the guitar lying on the ground beside it. The back cover of Sgt. Pepper's is mostly red besides a picture of the four Beatles at the bottom. Paul has his back turned to the camera, alluding to his separation from the other Beatles through death. In a promotional image for the album, Paul is seen sporting a patch on his sleeve that says OPD. In England, the acronym OPD means officially pronounced dead, which is the same as DOA in America. The final track in the album, A Day in the Life, could be the most obvious and literal mention of the rumors. From He Blew His Mind Out in a Car to I Read the News Today Oh Boy, this song is packed with evidence. Magical Mystery Tour is another album that is packed with evidence. Let's begin by taking a look at the front cover. There isn't too much to see, just the four Beatles dressed up as animals. Very psychedelic. But take a look at the Beatle dressed up as a walrus. In the song Glass Onion, John recites the line, Now here's another clue for you all. The walrus was Paul. If this is true, the walrus on the cover of the album is the only member of the band to wear black, once again alluding to the color of death. Now let's take a look at the band's name on the top. When viewed upside down, the stars that spell out the Beatles' name show a phone number of some sort. The number, 231-7438. This phone number became rumored to be a special Paul McCartney is dead hotline. Watch the promotional film for the track, Your Mother Should Know. As you can clearly see, the Beatles are all sporting roses on their suits. Typically, someone would just brush over that detail. However, you can see that Paul sports a black rose. On top of this, McCartney told the press that the only reason he wore a black flower was because they ran out of red ones. The song Strawberry Fields Forever, which appeared on the B-side of the album, also features a clue to McCartney's death. At the end of the track, you can hear John mutter, I buried Paul. Take a listen. Creepy. Moving on to the Beatles' next album, the 1968 album named The Beatles, better known as The White Album. The album includes what is known as one of the strongest pieces of evidence in this theory, the infamous Revolution No. 9. Throughout said song, John Lennon is heard to say No. 9. It was found that if you are to play the song in reverse, No. 9 changes to five haunting words. Turn me on, dead man. Turn me on, dead man. 
Disturbing coincidence or not, that is not the only clue that comes with the song. When in reverse, people have heard sounds of fire and crowds chanting, let him out, let him out, possibly referring to letting McCartney out of the burning wreckage of his vehicle. The true smoking gun to this thread is the reverse speech about six minutes in. A voice yells, let me out, and even some faint cries are heard. Taking a look inside of the cover of the album and removing the included collage poster is a photo of Ringo eating crayons. Truly inspirational. No, I'm just kidding. In the top left corner of this photo, what is believed to be an autopsy photo of Paul resides. Hospitals usually clean bodies that have been involved in accidents before they send them off to be buried. <laughs> I'm So Tired, another song in the White Album. In the final few moments, John speaks a foreign language. Without context, this can be interpreted as gibberish. But once the track is reversed, John says, Paul is a dead man. Miss him, miss him, miss him. There isn't as much evidence in Yellow Submarine than there is in the other albums, but this is what we could find. On the cover, John's hand is raised above Paul's head, similar to the hand above Paul on Sgt. Pepper. Other than that, there isn't that much evidence in this album. Maybe they forgot to put in more clues for obvious reasons. The Beatles' second to last studio LP, Abbey Road, holds the most evidence out of any other album. However, unlike the other albums, the evidence is entirely on the front cover. We see the Beatles walking down the crosswalk outside of Abbey Road Studios. In normal cases, the purchaser of the album would simply regard the cover as a regular Beatles cover, but it has deep meaning. Let's begin with John. He's dressed in all white and sports a long beard. He can easily be addressed as the heavenly figure. Behind him is Ringo. The clothing he's wearing is intended to look like a pallbearer. Next is Paul himself. He walks out of step with the other Beatles, has no shoes on, and holds a cigarette in his right hand. Paul was a dominant lefty, so the fact that he holds this in his right hand adds more evidence. Because of all these factors, Paul can be addressed as the corpse. That's right, the cover of Abbey Road depicts a funeral procession. When we look at George behind Paul, we see that he's only wearing denim, making him look shockingly similar to a grave digger. These factors aren't the only clues that are in the cover of the album. Take a look at the Volkswagen Beetle in the background. If you look closely, you'll see that the license plate says 28 if, doing the math, from 1966 to 1969, had Paul survived the car accident, he would have been 28 if he was still alive. 1970's Let It Be did not feature any clues to the Rockers cover-up. However, the November 7, 1969 issue of Time magazine held its own clue. The title article of this particular magazine issue was appropriately named, Paul is Still With Us. The cover featured a photo of Paul, his wife Linda, and his two children at his farm. This seemed innocent enough. However, turning the cover and holding it up to direct sunlight revealed an ad for a 1970 Ford Mercury that coincidentally appeared to be driving through Paul. Most of the clues we've shared today can easily be proved false. The cover of Sgt. Pepper's, particularly the placement of the members of the band, was purely coincidental. The Beatles tried several different positions for the shot. Paul appeared in several places. This proves that the open palm above Paul's head could have been over any of the members. The same goes for the back cover. The Beatles tried to be different and show that they were not the same band they used to be. Hence, going with the photo of Paul with his back turned. The color of the instrument Paul holds on the front cover is also coincidental. Sure, there's a baritone sitting next to the hookah pipe that he could have held, but he chose to use the cor anglaeus. I probably butchered that name. And the date on the drum isn't even in the European style. To them, the date would actually read September 11th, which is its own story. In the promo image for the album, Paul's patch actually reads OPP, which was a police department from the local area. The song A Day in the Life was not actually about Paul. Instead, it was about Tara Brown, who perished in a car accident at the age of 21. He had formed a relationship with the members of the band, even being an enabler for the Beatles' heavy use of LSD, but we won't talk about that. The clues on the front of Magical Mystery Tour can also be proven false. Watching the music video from the song I Am The Walrus shows John portraying the walrus while Paul is dressed as a hippo. The phone number on the cover is also false. For one, the number is a North American styled phone number, not a British phone number. The number did not even link to a Paula's Dead hotline in any cases. 
Instead, people would end up calling an insurance company or a local fast food restaurant. In the song Strawberry Fields Forever, what was mistaken as I Buried Paul was actually cranberry sauce, or as the Beatles press officer claimed, I'm very bored. As for the photos in the inside the poster of the White Album, the photo of William Campbell was actually just Paul wearing glasses and a fake mustache. And the supposed autopsy photos was just Paul in the bathtub. Because, come on, who uses bubble bath in an autopsy? John saying Paul is a dead man, miss him, miss him, miss him, is actually John speaking in a foreign language, as I mentioned earlier. People took that audio, reversed it, and thought they heard this. As for the Abbey Road album cover, this too is purely coincidental. Paul chose not to wear shoes because he claimed that it was too hot outside when they took the photo. The only thing out of every clue in the Beatles discography that we can't explain is Revolution 9. Why does reversing number 9 become Turn Me On Dead Man? Why does reversing the song in general produce sounds of flames, car crashes, and screaming? We chose to believe that Paul is still alive, but then again, the floor is still open for debate. Paul is Dead is a theory that has been affecting the music industry for over 50 years, and it still has a massive cult following. In the words of F. Lee Bailey, it's up to you to decide what you believe. Stay curious. Join us again next time, when we once again go obscure.